Today I want to talk about three misconceptions that we often have about programming in C-sharp as it pertains to Unity. And while these misconceptions are usually geared towards Unity beginners, I do want to go a little bit further with each one so that even those of you who are at a more advanced level might be able to pick up some useful tips, or maybe you have something you want to add in the comments as well. These kinds of videos always generate some great tips and insights in the comments below. So let's get started here. I want to see if you know what will happen with the first statement. I'm going to start with this one here. Let's zoom in a little bit. I'm going to put a one liner in here and I want you to think about this just for a second. What do you suppose is going to happen when I go back into Unity and press play? Rider isn't showing me any errors. Do you think it will run? So if I'm back over here and I click on play, look what we get in the log. Invalid cast exception. A nice purple message for us. It's going to cause big time problems in our game. Now, where I positioned this in the start method, of course, we're going to see this right away while we're developing. But if you were doing this nested into some logic that you've created deep down inside of your program, you might never see it until you've actually sent it off for playtesting. Now, the C-sharp misconception I want to talk about is not about casting transforms into rec transforms. I think most of you could probably see that one coming a mile off. The misconception that I actually want to talk about is that we should avoid exception throwing methods as much as possible. But how would we actually do that? Well, we could do it with the as keyword. Using the as keyword, if it were to actually fail, instead of throwing an exception, we'll just get a null. So now this really becomes a null check. And I would say this is probably a fine approach if this is a non-critical path in your program. So if we get the rec transform, then great. We can do something with it. If not, let's just put a message out letting us know that, you know, something that we didn't expect happened. Why don't we make sure this works as expected? I'm just going to click play here. And yeah, right away we see we get our message saying that, yeah, this is not actually a rec transform and the game just carries on. Now, let's go back into code and suppose that this is a critical path, meaning we need the game to stop and we have to handle this exception. What I'll do here is just select all of this code that we just were working on with the as keyword. Let's get rid of this. Instead, what I'm going to do is start a try catch block just above my old code that was throwing the exception before. And this time what we'll do is actually catch that exception and handle it. So I'm going to uncomment out the code here and then I'm going to add a catch block or rather I'm going to let Copilot do it because it already knows what kind of exception this is going to be. It's going to be an invalid cast exception and we can handle it accordingly. So, of course, when I press play here, we're seeing our red error message and not that purple exception. So the main takeaway here is that exceptions are beneficial when the presence of a component or a condition is critical and failure to meet the expectations should immediately halt execution or flag an error. Non-exception methods like the try parse method or first or default or using the as keyword are suitable when there is a logical alternative or some default action to take if the operation doesn't succeed. Now, while we're on the subject, I want to point out a feature in Unity that is often overlooked. You see here on the top of my console pro, I've got a button here that says error pause. This button is also available in the regular console. Let me just open that up and show you. What this will do is pause the game anytime that you log an error, anytime an exception is thrown, or anytime you make an assertion, a debug assert, and it fails. So I'm going to hit play here. And of course, we see our message again, but this time the game pauses itself. So this is extremely convenient if you want to start catching these little errors and doing some debugging. So that's just a little convenience that's been there all along, probably right under your nose. Hit that like button if you didn't know that one before today. OK, so just to recap this, if it's mission critical, it's useful to put it into a try catch and actually do something. Catching the exception here forces you to handle the exception at the source. If you were to just use the as keyword, you might not even know that there was some problem until you actually checked it for null later on in your program. If you even remember to check it for null, in which case you're going to get an entirely different exception thrown. OK, well, let's open up a can of worms here and address the misconception that the equality operator or the equals equals operator represents the same thing as the equals method on an object. Now, typically, you can operate under the assumption that value types will always try to compare by value Reference types will always try to compare by reference. But this isn't always the case. Let's start by looking at strings. I'm going to initialize two strings here, both with exactly the same value. And then let's see what happens with equals equals and with the equals method. Remember that strings are a reference type in C-sharp, but they do have different behavior than other reference types. 
both the equals equals operator and the equals method are overridden to compare value types, not reference types. And so both equals equals and the equals method should return true when comparing these two string instances, even though they are separate objects in memory. Let's jump back into Unity and make sure that's correct. If I zoom in on the console there, you'll see, yep, both of those return true. Okay, let's move on to look at objects. Okay, let's start a new class here. I'm just gonna call it my class and it's just gonna have one property, an integer called value. We'll have a constructor that'll take in a value and set it. And that's really all we need for this simple test. Back in our example class, let's make a few instances of my class. So object one will be my class, the value of one. Let's make the exact same thing for object two, same value. And then let's make object three equals object one. Now we can have a few debug statements to test this out. So object one equals equals object two, object one equals object two. And then let's check equals equals between object one and object three. If I hit play here, let's have a look at the console. So equals equals between the first two objects was false. We know they were different references, but look at the equals method, also false. This is because system.object falls back on the reference equals method. So both of those comparisons are by reference. Now it is true that many developers will use the equals method in their custom types to compare by value and equals equals to compare by reference, but it's not always the case. You just have to be mindful of that. Let's have a look at how we can actually override equals in our custom type here to compare by value instead of by reference. Let's start with a guard clause. If the object coming into this method is null or it's not the same type as this object, return false, let's get out of here. Otherwise, let's cast that object into this type and then we can return whether or not the value of this object is equal to the value of the other object. So here we're using equals equals again, but remember we're comparing integers here. So we're making a value comparison. When overriding the equals method, it's a good practice to also override the get hash code method because doing so ensures that the objects considered equal will have the same hash code, which is crucial for the correct functioning of hash based collections like hash set and dictionary. So let's find out what happens when I click play now. So first of all, we can see that object one and object two are not the same reference, but they do have the same value. They both had the value passed in of one. The reference comparison between object one and object three remains the same. So for interest's sake, let's make our my class just a little bit more complicated. Let's add one more property. We'll just make it a string called name. We can pass that in through the constructor and then set it as well. Now we're going to want to update our equals method because we have another public property that kind of defines the value of this object. So instead of just comparing the value property, let's also compare the name property. And if both of those things are true, let's return true. Now we can also update our get hash code method to incorporate the name property. You can do that easily using the hash code static method combine. That'll let you pass in up to eight values that you can combine into a unique hash code. Now, this is a very effective way of generating hash codes based on values contained in a class, but it's not 100% collision free. In fact, it's impossible to write your own hash code method that will be 100% collision free. Some people like to implement this common algorithm that is very effective. It has to be wrapped in an unchecked block because get hash code must never throw an exception. Start your hash with an odd prime number. Then we start multiplying that hash by another odd prime number plus the get hash code of the different properties inside of this object. After we're done all the multiplication, we can pass it back. Now the prime numbers promote uh, even distribution throughout the hash table. So this is a very common and effective way of creating hash codes, but even this is not 100% collision free. Before we start talking about collision free, let's do a sanity check and make sure this works. Let's jump back into the example class and make sure that we're passing in a string value to each of these. And then we'll just jump into Unity again. Okay, so I hit play and nothing's really changed. Object one and object two still have different references, but in terms of value equality, they are the same. If you do need to guarantee zero collisions, the best way to do this is with a unique identifier. Let's go through an example just doing that with an integer. Let's make a static integer. We'll call it next ID starting at number one. We can initialize a property called ID on each instance of my class with the value of next ID. And as soon as we've initialized it, we just bump up the next ID by one. 
Now, with that ID in place, we don't need to compare these other values of the object because the index determines the uniqueness of this instance. Down in the equals method, we can just compare IDs between the two objects. And if we scroll down a little bit, we can actually simplify this get hash code method. Now we can return ID.getHashCode if we want. However, in C sharp, the get hash code method of an integer simply returns the integer itself. So instead of doing this, we can actually just return the ID. Now, of course, this is not 100% collision free because, you know, eventually after you've used 2 billion plus integers, it's going to roll all the way back around and try to use integer number one again. Anyway, coming back to the misconception, we can't always assume that equals does the same thing as the equality operator because both of these things can be overridden. And how would we do this on a custom type? Well, we'd use the operator keyword and indicate which operator we want to overload. Here we need to pass in the two things we're going to compare. We could say if both of these things are equal to null, we could return true because they technically are equal. If one of them is equal to null but not the other, let's return false. And if not, then let's just make our comparison against the ID like we were doing before. Or you could compare the values as we did before that. Now you need to be symmetrical about this. Whenever you implement the equality operator, you should also implement the not equals operator. Okay, so now we have a custom type that is using both the equals method and the equality operator to confirm the value of the ID of each instance. Okay, well, I hope that gives you some ideas on how you can handle these things in your own custom types. Let's move on to another misconception. If you're coming from a background in Python or JavaScript, you're used to dynamic types. That means that the language runtime determines the type of the variable as it's required. So it's a common misconception in C-sharp that the var keyword indicates a dynamic type. This isn't the case. Let's dig into this. So the dynamic keyword does exist in C-sharp, and it was introduced in C-sharp 4. However, Unity does not support it for the immediate language to C++ scripting backend, which means that for quite a lot of your builds, it's not available. And for that reason, most people just avoid the dynamic keyword altogether. So the var keyword in C-sharp is used for implicitly typing a variable. This allows the compiler to infer the variable's type based on the assigned value at compile time. That's why we're able to write var my number equals 42, and the compiler is able to infer the type of my number based on the value that we've assigned to it. Of course, if we try to assign a different type into my number now, we're going to get an error. Now, I realize that most of you who watch this channel are already familiar with the fact that dynamic is not the same thing as an implicitly typed variable. So we're not going to dwell on this too much, but I did want to talk about how we initialize these kinds of variables. If we declare a more complex type, so a dictionary of type int that has a list of strings as the values, here we're explicitly saying what type this is twice, and it's unnecessary. It's just a bunch of visual noise. So we could use var in the beginning here, and then when we're assigning a new dictionary into this variable, that infers the type for us. We can tell just by reading it one time what type dictionary one is. Let's make another one though, because there's another way to do this. What if we make a dictionary two? And in this time, instead of using the var keyword, we use the target type new keyword. These are semantically the exact same thing. So one limitation with var is that you can only use it in a local scope when you're declaring and initializing a variable in the same line. That means we have to use the second syntax when we're declaring things at a field level. We can't use var. There is another time, though, that I will make it explicit, and that's if I'm getting something back from a function and it's not really clear what the return type is at least not at a glance. So let's suppose we had this method here that's down off screen somewhere and I can't see it immediately. If I was to use the var keyword here, say var something equals whatever the result of this function was. Now, just looking at this, I have no idea what something is at all. In fact, if I was to do even this, something.transform.rotation, well, you know, almost everything in Unity has a transform. I still don't know what this is. <laughs> it's not clear without hovering over it or going to look at the actual method or anything like that. So here in this case, I would definitely opt to explicitly define the type instead of using the var keyword. Another time you might want to use the var keyword is when you're returning non-trivial or sometimes impossible to predict types. So for example, from a link expression. Okay, that's probably enough about the var keyword, but if you have anything to add, feel free to leave a comment below. 
So I'm just going to add one more thing, and that is that all of these things that I've talked about today came from comments under YouTube videos or discussions on Discord from the last couple months. So if you have a question about Unity or C Sharp that you'd like me to talk about on this channel, please post it in the comments under this video so I can keep track of it in case I do a follow up because I actually have several other misconceptions I'd like to talk about in the future. That's all I've got time for today, but I do have a whole week off coming up. So next week's video is going to be a banger. Hit the notification bell if you want to stay on top of that on. And of course, if you're not sick of the channel yet, I'll put a few videos up on the screen. And don't forget, we've got a great Discord server that you can join if you want to discuss these kinds of topics with more like-minded peers. Maybe I'll see you there.